FBI says you're a member of the Colombo Mafia family. Like I said, the FBI can uh, allege and say whatever they like. They've been doing it for many, many years. But what could I say? That's the FBI. That's law enforcement. But two weeks... And you had Nicky Eyes. What's up, guy? And Mikey Francesi. Michael Francesi, said by police to be a young, tough boss in the mafia. But I had about uh, 12 to 15 soldiers under me all the time, and they were made men. Authorities in New York and Florida say Francesi, who is only in his 30s, is the youngest mafia boss in the country and possibly the richest. At the height of our operation, we were doing a half a billion gallons a month. Francesi's movie company was really an elaborate front, just one of many front companies the mob used to hide millions of dollars from a new mafia racket, gasoline. We infiltrated every area of society. Vegas was built on mob money. We had pension funds, we had unions. I mean, I helped, you know, um, Mar Shanker the Dunes Hotel. I had no interest in being a member of that life because my father never pushed it on me. He told me the opposite. It's actually better not to be bound by morality because when you're not bound by morality, you can do anything that you want. The City of Sin. The mentality behind one of the Mafia's most influential figures begins in a place directly built by money from organized crime. Michael Francis is one of few survivors of a life in which he had no intentions of being a part of. This iconic city sets the perfect tone when meeting with the man who could have had everything so easily taken away from him, when it was here that everything was so easily taken away from its mafia roots. Welcome to fabulous Las Vegas. Throughout the years, the city of Las Vegas rebranded itself as family-oriented, but this pretense never really solidified itself into a valid reality. You didn't come to Las Vegas to spend time with your family. You came to Las Vegas to lose yourself. Much like how many men involved in the Mafia lost themselves with their false sense of security from many of the same luxuries. In a city of illusions, how could I see Michael Francis not as a mob boss, not as a goldmine for film scripts, nor as a magnet for clicks or other viral content, but to see him as a man who had done all he could in order to live with the choices that he made. Michael went to jail and Vegas became gentrified. How would Michael feel being in such a different city than the one he remembered, as he himself also changed the dynamic of his representation, much like how Vegas did? He is successful and wealthy, however devoid of the life that gave him everything. But in the end, that same life took everything away from him. Since 1931, five families have run New York's Italian-American Mafia. The names are familiar. Bonanno, Lucchese, Gambino, Genovese, Colombo. Could another mob war be brewing? <clears throat> Mr. Francis, I want to start off by thanking you for coming here today. It's truly a pleasure and a privilege. Oh, my pleasure. Very welcome. My name is Michael Francis, and I am a former member of the Colombo crime family in New York, one of the five Mafia Cosa Nostra families. Uh, I was a soldier in a couple regime in that life uh, for a, a little over 20 years and walked away from that life in 1995, and now, you know, I'm on a totally different path. I see a big similarity between you and Michael Corleone. You know, I'm sure you've been told this before but um, you were a pre-med student, um, like, like said in the movie, a good college kid. Uh, you got in the life to help your father. Michael Corleone also got involved in the life to help his mm -hmm. father. And yeah, I mean, I've heard that all my life, you know, that, right. you know, is the character based upon you? Or, you know, you're a similar character to Michael Corleone. And, you know, there are similarities. I mean, without right. a doubt, like you said, we both uh, were not destined for that life originally. You know, my dad wanted me to be a doctor. I was an athlete in school. And I never aspired to be a mob guy, even though I grew up in the life with my dad. But we both got drawn into it, you know, to help our fathers in different ways. And um, as a result, we, uh, you know, we were uh, really entrenched in the life. And, uh, you know, once you take that oath and once you get involved, that's it. It's your life. Did you desire to be like your father? In what way? Growing up, did you sort of desire to be involved with a life as a much younger child? No. 
Um, I had no interest in being a member of that life because my father never pushed it on me. He never said, this is what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he always told me, you got to get an education. You got to be legitimate, stay off the street. He told me the opposite until, you know, the roof fail, uh, caved in on him and then things changed. It's Michael Franzisi's father, John Sonny Franzisi, one of the top mafia bosses in the country, who was released from prison just last month and met at the prison gate by his son, Michael. Well, Mike, I tell you, you looked up to your father. Yeah, I mean, look, I love my dad till the end. We had our differences, obviously. You know, I, you know, my ideology changed a little bit. You know, not a little bit, a lot, dr right. drastically. I mean, I walked away from the life, so he had a, he had an issue with that, but he understood. And um, you know, I always loved him. Um, like I said, we had differences, uh, but he's dad. You know, when you lose a parent uh, at, at any stage, I mean, he was 103. Wow. Uh, but when you lose a parent at any stage, it hurts. What a fantastic life, 103. Yeah, I mean, he lived a long life, but you know, I always tell people the last 40 years, 50 years of his life, you wouldn't want it. I mean, he did 40 years in prison. You know, during that time, he lost his wife. He lost uh, two of my sisters passed away. My brother, you know, had a drug problem, eventually turned down my dad. Uh, he lost all his family while he was in jail. So, I mean, it's one of the, uh, you know, one of the hazards of the life. Michael's father was Sonny Francis. He served as a longtime member and underboss of the Colombo crime family before serving a 50 year sentence for alleged bank robbery charges in 1967. His last 50 years were filled with devastation and grief as his family was torn apart. Your father was sent to prison almost in a corrupt way. He, he got sentenced to 50 years in prison for organizing bank robberies? He supposedly masterminded a nationwide string of bank robberies. Right. And, you know, Shane, I can tell you this. I went to jail for a crime that I was guilty of. Committed the crime, pled guilty, did my time. My dad did a lot of bad things in his life. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I won't cover for that. I'm not going to get into that. But the crime that he went to prison for, he wasn't guilty of. He was framed. 100%, I'll take that to my grave. I investigated that case. Uh, the government uh, was in on a frame with him. They right. Framed him. He did all that time for a crime he didn't commit. So you're not really, you know, we're not really denying that your father committed a crime, but it's just wrong for the fact that he went to prison for a crime he didn't really commit. You know, I sort of see a similarity between, um, I'm sure you know this, Luciano was sentenced to 30 to mm -hmm. 50 years for prostitution charges. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, you know, and you know, the thing is, people have said to me, well, he got sentenced for what he got away with. Well, that's not how our system no. should operate. If that's the case, the government can accuse anybody anytime <laughs> right. they want of anything they want. You know, if we don't hold law enforcement and government uh, to the law, then what do we have? We, have? we have nothing left. You know, criminals, they're criminals. But I can tell you this, there's enough laws on the books, okay, to go after somebody and get them the right way. What are your views on the government's motives today? You know, I mean, uh, I've been around a long time and, I, you know, for me, I've never, I, I'm more disappointed and frustrated with the operation of the government as it exists today than I've ever been in my life. Right. I mean, there was a time when, you know, we had politicians on the payroll, you know, and I, I used them to my benefit, especially in the gas business. And they would get me licenses. but. Today, it's like uh, they're very Machiavellian. It's all right. about them. They care more for themselves and their own agenda than they do for the people. It's obvious to me. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a book. It's called The Mafia Democracy. It'll be out early next year. And unfortunately, I make some very valid comparisons in the way the mob operated and the way our government is operating today. You know, people tell me all the time, Michael, the mob should be running the country. I said, no, like they shouldn't Vegas. be. Yeah, <laughs> they shouldn't be. I'm currently standing in the courtroom of what used to be Las Vegas' old courthouse. The same building has now been transformed into the exhibit we know as the Mob Museum. I am proud to announce the museum as a partner in this collaboration. Many people's fates have been decided in this very spot, especially those who have been involved with the Mafia. The government should be running it, but they should be running it <clears throat> according to the constitutional laws that, you know, that were created to run this country. They're not doing that. Exactly. It's um. Funny that you said Machiavellian, mm -hmm. because there's a saying, don't become a criminal because the government does not like your competition. <laughs> the government always seems to fail in one area where the mob succeeds, 
American society has kept the people divided for centuries and the country has not learned the valuable lesson that the mob learned very early on. In order to run a successful operation, it must be built on loyalty in order for it to remain united. When it comes to maintaining power and control, the government only had itself to blame for making the mob what it was. The very thing that America lacks. As I previously stated, don't become a criminal because the government doesn't like the competition. Michael Francis is no stranger to this type of corruption that takes place both in the government and through the operations of the mob. Mr. Francis, and many men in his position, saw the perfect opportunity to succeed in what the government had failed at time and time again. You know, it's not the way you want to operate your life. No, definitely not. Um, it's, a, it's actually a difficult book to sort of understand and comprehend. It is, you know, but if you understand his basic ideology, because in that book he is uh, advising the prince how to maintain control of his kingdom. And basically what Machiavelli says, you know, to, to cut right to the chase is you can do anything you need to do to maintain control. You can lie, steal, cheat, kill, anything you need to do. But to the outside public, you always have to appear to be honest, upright, and have integrity. That's his philosophy. That's his ideology. And then he says, it's actually better not to be bound by morality, because when you're not bound by morality, you can do anything that you want. But people have to think that you are. So it's very deceitful. And to me, that's how our government operates. Right. You know, everything is about the people according to them, but it's really not. You so know? you don't think they're as progressive as they claim to be? And as no, I, I don't. You know, it's, it's whatever their own agenda is. That's what they're trying to accomplish. Look, I learned on the street, you know, there's, there's two things that are devastating in life if they get out of control. And that is the love of money and the, and the desire for power. And our government officials, they have both. Of course. And unfortunately, their own agenda comes before everybody else in order to maintain that. That's how I see it. You think they operate worse now than they did in your prime time in the 80s? Oh, no doubt. Well, look, it's a criminal lifestyle. Right. You know, so, so but I, I will tell you this. You know, the one reason why the mafia, Cosa Nostra, in this country was able to survive and prosper for well over 100 years. You know, I mean, our presence was over 100 years or around 100 years, but is because we infiltrated every area of society from the man on the street with the numbers rackets right up to the White House. The Mafia in Italy became a, a very strong force, originally intended to uh, people band together to uh, protect people against what they felt was a government oppression. Eventually, a lot of those same individuals or relatives of them came over to the United States. They emigrated here. They got together in smaller cities and towns. Unfortunately, before you know it, uh, you know, they started preying on their own people. Um, you know, a lot of them did, you know, on shop owners and, and business people. Uh, but eventually, um, you know, over a period of time, it grew into a, a major criminal organization that had a tremendous impact on uh, America for many, many years, many decades. We control the unions at one time. You control the unions in America, you control the country. That's it. End of story. You know, we had the Teamsters Union. We got two and a half million people working for us. You call a strike, nothing moves in this country. Every truck stops a value. You call a strike at the dock, nothing comes in or out. Done. That's a lot of power. Right. Politicians know that. They're aware of that. Also, voting power. I got two and a half million people. I can influence them to vote your way. But hey, I want this in return. NBC News has found that at least five companies, now identified by authorities as mob fronts, made contributions to a campaign fund for New York Governor Mario Cuomo. Federal witness Aya Rizzo has told authorities he was ordered by his mob boss, Michael Francisi, to write a check to the Cuomo campaign. Politicians are easy in that regard, you know? Also, we had huge pension funds. Vegas was built on mob money. Right. That was Bugsy it. Siegel. Yeah, mob Founder. money. We had pension funds, we had unions. I mean, I helped, you know, um, you know, Mar Shanker at the Dunes Hotel. I got him some union money too, you know, when he was building Atlantic City because I had, I had contacts in a certain union that I controlled. So, I mean, there's a lot of power there, but we did that. You take a lot of these other groups, they're all built around drugs. You take mm -hmm. the drugs away, they're done. It wasn't like that for us. We, we infiltrated every, every sector of society that meant something. Let me tell you, you know, I'll, I'll tell you who helped 
the mob become the mob that it is, and that's the government. It was prohibition that gave the mob right. the money and the power and the influence to do what they did. It was prohibition. They, they, they fell right into the mob's hands with that. Because you give us a situation where we could figure out how to run with it, we're going to do it. You think, you know, alcohol is harmful, but it gives Al Capone a goddamn empire. Well, you can't ban something that the public wants. Exactly. They're going to figure out a way to get it. And if we can fill that void, we're going to do it. And we did it spectacularly well. People here come here, they have input. Police in states along the Atlantic coast have been following the movement of hundreds of millions of gallons of gasoline by companies said to be controlled by the mafia. I want to move on to the prime of your career, the infamous gas scheme. <laughs> well, listen, I don't, I don't know that there'll ever be another no. scheme like that. Or, you know, I mean, look, with, uh, with tech being the way it is today, maybe they can develop something online. Mm -hmm. who knows? But it was, uh, it was a tremendous moneymaker for me and for the family and for others, you know, that got involved. But, um, you know, I ran it for seven, eight years. Uh, we made, you know, multi-millions of dollars uh, weekly. And it was a great scam, you know, until it, until it fell apart. And I went to jail. The mob goes where the money is, and over the years, it has moved into legitimate businesses as well as drugs and vice. It has controlled construction projects, meatpacking operations, the clothing trade. Now, a new ripoff for the mob. Among many things I was doing, uh, created a scheme where myself and my group, along with the Russian mob from Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, to um, defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. Because they don't pay gasoline taxes, the mob sells gasoline to gas stations at prices three to four cents a gallon lower than legitimate dealers can offer. We were selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month, taking down 20, 30, 40 cents a gallon, whatever the market will bear at that time. Authorities say the mafia first moved into the gasoline business in New York and is now active in at least 12 other states. I had over 350 gas stations I either owned or operated in, in several states. So it was a, a major scam, a major enterprise for the Colombo family. By some estimates, the loss in gasoline taxes is as much as $1 billion. The numbers were as high as $10 million a week. I mean, that's insane. That's, that's almost unheard of. Well, listen, we were grossing, you know, it, it all, it, it, here's a breakdown. There was weeks we'd bring in 5 million, weeks we'd bring in 15 million. It all right. depended. You know, the, the tax on every gallon of gasoline at that time was 9 cents federal, 25 to 30 cents state and local, depending upon where you are. So you had almost 40 cents a gallon. I had that kind of a spread to work with on a half a billion gallons of gas a month. Do the math. It was a tremendous amount of money. And uh, we were actually, we were dropping the, the price at the pumps because we were able to give it to the end buyer cheaper. He would drop his prices, people would gas up cheaper. We were like the Robin Hoods at that time. <laughs> so nobody was mad at us except the government. Organized crime now has muscled into the gasoline business in a big way and cheated the government out of hundreds of millions of dollars of tax dollars. Tonight, Brian reports on some of the ways that the mob uses those dollars. Last year, something very strange happened in movie making. Big production scenes were shot on location in Miami Beach for a movie that has never been released by a production company that nobody had ever heard of. And the movie's producer was a man every police detective in New York had heard of, Michael Francisi. The government's informant, Larry Iarizzo, says Francisi's movie company was really an elaborate front just one of many front companies the mob used to hide millions of dollars from a new mafia racket, gasoline. Well, listen, I had a lot of perks, you know, I made a lot of money and, uh, you know, I had a jet plane, I had a helicopter, I had a house in Florida, New York, California. I had a big crew around me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a lot of good times. I mean, you know, the camaraderie among the guys that I had was very special to me. You know, there's nothing like this brotherhood with men. You know, I got your back, you got mine. Wherever you go in the world, there'll be somebody, a brother there to greet you, you know, and, and, and uh, be by your side. I mean, that's very powerful. And I enjoyed that. 
With Michael's Italian-American roots being the backbone of his life story, it's important that we partner with a brand that so closely represents the values and morals that are heavily embedded in the culture. Something similar that I see between all mob guys is greed. Uh, let me let me tell you something, Shane. You know how you get recognized in life? You're not greedy. You go into a restaurant, you tip a guy really well, it can't wait for you to come back. Anything that you want, you got. And so I learned that in an early age. Right. And you know, I walk into a place and they knew who I was. I took care of people. You got a ringside table, people are catering to you, it's nice. Right. But you took care of them as a result, you know. You know, they did the work, you took care of them. So yeah, I miss that. I don't, I mean, I'm still a pretty generous guy with my tips, but <laughs> people earn it, you know, they treat you good, you, you compensate them. But, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a good life in that regard. Michael Francis is the living representation of how being involved in this life can only add additional problems instead of fixing the fundamental issues that led him into a life of crime. After initially getting involved to help support his family, the level of his operations quickly exceeded the necessities needed for survival, leaving Mr. Francis with only two options, his inevitable prison sentence or his inevitable death. What's stopping you from running? Because you know eventually you're either going to end up in jail or you're going to end up dead. It's, uh, it's not in me to run. There's probably serious precautions you took for being a survivor. What I did, I did for the right reasons, I believe and um, it's turned out well for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a lot of struggles and challenges to get to this point, but, you know, I mean, look, some people, ah, oh, you know, you talk to the government. Yeah, I talked to the government. You talked about your life. Yeah, I talked about the life, but I did it for the right reasons. I didn't put anybody in prison. No. You know, I didn't turn against my former associates in that way. So, uh, you know, I did it to preserve my family. You know, I was told that, you know, be careful if you go into town and, you know, so I mean, who needs that? Right. You know, I knew I was going to have trouble when I walked away from the life. I mean, I understood that right. people were not going to be happy. They were going to be upset. Uh, but remember, I had a lot of experience in that life. You know, one of the horrors of that life, you make a mistake. Your best friend walks you into a room. You don't walk out again. Well, I knew nobody was going to do that with me because they're going to they, they wanted me. They're going to have to come and get me. And I knew how to protect myself. I didn't create patterns in my life. I didn't do certain things. I didn't go hang out in clubs where I knew, you know, I'd be noticed and seen and somebody wanted to take a shot at me, they could. So, I mean, you know, I use my head, you know, you got to be smart. So, um, and I was very disciplined mm -hmm. you know, because one thing about that life, you need to learn and you need to know how to be disciplined and how to respect authority. So I learned that and I was very disciplined in my daily routine. And I just outlasted everybody. And right. again, you know, again, Shane, I never hurt anybody. People can say what they want, and Michael's talking about the life. Yeah, I talk about it, but I never hurt anybody. And that's the bottom line. Because when somebody, well, who did he hurt? Nobody. Well, I can't answer that, because it didn't happen. So that's, that's the thing. So after a while, people say, okay, you know, I, I get it. Yeah, he wants to talk, let him talk, but he's not hurting us. And there's people are in that life right now that I just, I, one guy in particular, I'm not going to mention his name, but I love the guy, you know, he did a lot of time in prison. He's home now. He's elderly. I love him. Can't get back together with him, but right. you know, he's a great guy. And I had good feelings for a lot of the guys. I didn't walk away from that life because I was mad at anybody. I didn't want revenge. You know, mm -hmm. you hear a lot of these informants, well, the life is horrible. They did. They, they want revenge. I'm not looking for revenge. I, you know, I, I never wanted that. I knew the life was in trouble and it played out. I mean, everybody's either dead or in prison. 
How did your associates end up? They're all dead. They're all dead. Um, it's sad. You know, the sad thing about it is you're, they're all dead. I mean, there's, there's one or two people that I think might be alive, but right. they're in their 90s, they're in prison or out of prison, so they're practically dead. And then there's me, who's running around free and doing my thing. And, and uh, you know, that's a pretty telling statistic right there. So, Michael, I want to go back to talking about your father a little bit. Um, when your father passed away, I've, I've heard you did not attend his funeral. No, I didn't. Um, I don't know if you'd like to explain. People don't know that, you know, oh, Michael didn't go to the funeral. Right. Well, first of all, it's none of that business. I didn't want to become the center of attention there. I knew who was going to be there. It was back in my old neighborhood, mm -hmm. where Brooklyn. it was. And um, I, I visited my father privately. I just didn't do it publicly. Right. You know, I mean, look, my dad is dead. It's not like he's alive. I respected him when he was alive. And I'll pay my respects, you know, until I die for of course. my dad and the rest of my family. I have sisters, my mother. You know, when I visit them, when I visit them. I think that's a great example of what the life really comes down to, where a son cannot attend his father's, his own father's funeral. You got to understand something. I watched my family be totally devastated. I had two sisters that died at a very young age, one of an overdose of drugs. I had a brother that uh, was a drug addict his whole life, caught the HIV virus, eventually made a deal with the government, testified against my father. My mother, 33 years without a husband, you know, when she passed away in 2012, her relationship with my dad was ugly. My dad does 40 years in prison, basically died, you know, my dad was a big figure in that life and basically died alone. So what did it do for him? Destroyed his family, you know, and, and caused him to spend just a, half his life in prison. So, and why? Because it's a bad life. The government caught up with us and I didn't want that for my family. I didn't want that for my wife and children, nor did I want to hurt anybody. So I had to walk a very fine line. It was tough. I mean, don't get me wrong. Right. Because I tried to keep the government, to, look, I'm out of the life. You know, I think you took some very wise steps and literally the definition of a wise guy. Um, well, and those wise steps are why you're here today. And the world is a better place with you in and Mr. Francis. Um, for a lot of people watching at home seeing this, um, maybe someone wanted to take the wrong steps and after hearing about the things you talk about, they don't. Well, listen, part of my ministry, so to speak, is I go into prisons all the time and I speak to a lot of young people, a lot of these gangbangers, a lot of street kids, and I tell them straight out, you know, you do that, you stay in this life, you're gonna go down. Or you're gonna spend the rest of your life in prison, a good part of it, you're gonna be in and out, or you're gonna end up dead. It's one of the two, there's no other way out. And on that note, Mr. Francis, a big pleasure and a privilege on our team. And uh, I can't wait to do it once again. Thank well, you very we'll much, We'll do that. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay.